Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Nadia McConnell. I'm president of the U.S. Ukraine Foundation. Welcome to this webinar today, uh, which is being conducted in extraordinary circumstances, as I'm sure um, everybody who's tuning in is well aware. Last December, during our celebration uh, of Ukraine's independence and the 30th anniversary of the foundation, uh, we also had, uh, we nominated and identified what we called 30 stars of Ukraine. It was not a competition, it was not a contest. It was just an effort on our behalf to identify 30 people who during this period of independence had uh, achieved some level of success, which also uh, through their success helped to uh, paint a more complete picture of what Ukraine is and who the people of Ukraine are. Uh, there was a broad section of people. Uh, we've had, we have entertainers, uh, scientists, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we also have people who are representing a very important part of, of Ukraine today, and that is those that are fighting uh, Putin's war against Ukraine. In these extraordinary times, we are very grateful that we are we do have with us Yana Zinkavich and Oleg Sensov. Uh, though Oleg Sensov will be joining us uh, later in the program because he is uh, very active with uh, his activities regarding uh, the promotion of his uh, film Rhino. Yana, uh, who is also an incredibly busy woman, uh, a single mother, uh, member of parliament and uh, activist, and is going to be uh, with us, I think, shortly. Perhaps let me uh, introduce Yana uh, formally, and then when she arrives, we can get uh, straight to the questions. Um, Yana Zinkavich was born in Rivne, in Ukraine in 1995. In mid-2014, as a 19-year-old, she went as a medical volunteer to East Ukraine to help uh, as combat actions went hot. She personally moved about 200 wounded warriors from the battlefield. She also uh, created and headed Hospitaliers volunteer medical battalion that helped and saved more than 2,500 wounded military and civilians from the front line. She herself was seriously injured in a car accident in December in 2015, and to this day uh, must use a wheelchair. In 2019, Yana was elected to the Rada as the number seven candidate on the European Solidarity Party list. You know, after graduation from school and before the war with Russia, Yana was planning to go to enter a medical university. She has since then entered State Medical Academy in Dnipro. She did that in 2017 and I guess is set to graduate shortly. Um, she also has been de uh, decorated with the Ukrainian Order of Mer Merit and has the title of the People's Hero of Ukraine an unofficial award established uh, in the volunteer community to rec recognize extraordinary merits. And certainly uh, there's no question that Yana uh, deserved uh, this award. And really I'm sure that she is a symbol for all those others that joined her uh, in those early years at volunteers and stepped up to uh, the, uh, as they say, to the plate. Yana, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being with Hello, us. Hello, I'm here. Yes, thank you. We recognize that this is an extraordinary, uh, complicated time for you. Uh, as I said, not only as being a single mother, but also, of course, a member of parliament and all the other responsibilities that you have. So we are very, very grateful that you have taken time to uh, be with us today. Yana, I want to talk to you. Uh, I would like to divide our discussion with you, perhaps in into two parts. One has to do really more about your personal story, and the other would be to uh, as your uh, part of your work in the parliament. So, Yana, at the age nineteen, you decided to go and volunteer to the front. 
what was it that moved you to take this very uh, critical step, uh, stepping into danger? And I'm sure that your family was not, uh, perhaps were very worried about you going to the front. Can you tell us a little bit what it was that really uh, prompted you to take that step? Uh, Thank you. Uh, when, in 2013, when the Revolution of Dignity started, this must have been my first step to, uh, into public life. I could not uh, stay away. I was actively taking part in the Maidan in the city of Vinica. Also, I uh, visited uh, Kiev Maidan. I never got into any hot uh, clashes there. I was fortunate. But uh, I also was uh, taking part in various training programs in different cities for the right sector, uh, which was active in the Maidan, and I too uh, began to attend those military training uh, programs. In my region, uh, which is Rivna, we have some activists of uh, UNA, uh, UNSO uh, who all had taken part in uh, fighting against Russians uh, in some other countries and they uh, starting from uh, January of 2014 kept saying we feel that there will be a war with the Russia is, is going to start a war against us that sounded very strange at the time but that's those voices uh, were there so when uh, occupation of the Crimea started in uh, in February 2014 I understood what's going to come next and I began to pack my belongings, my uh, my bag. Uh, everything happened very quickly. Lots of people uh, did not understand uh, anything when uh, Russia seized Crimea. But when the war started in the Donbas, then I realized here I must take part. And so on April 3rd, I joined the first group from Rivna, and we moved to the first base of uh, right sector voluntary uh, volunteer battalion. At the time, I did not even expect uh, to be a medic. I just went as a fighter, but uh, there was a priority. Uh, I was at that time preparing for uh, entrance exams for medical school. So at least I had some little idea about uh, medical uh, help and uh, in the first few uh, fights I was taking uh, part actively and we realized that we had nobody to help the wounded and uh, the dead take care of the dead so that uh, pushed me towards becoming a full-time uh, medic of the battalion I was 18 at the time so I really had no life experience. I had just, uh, I, I was barely out of high school, but I realized there was no other way for me. I did not want to sit idle at home, even though I was really young and a female. And uh, in those days, it didn't look right to many people when young girls go to the war, uh, but this was not a way uh, to go for me. And my family understood that as well which is why they were prepared to, 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 to they realized I would go uh, one day, uh, one way or another. So, Jana, you uh, sort of as maybe a side comment, you're, you're mentioning about women were not necessarily seen in this role. And yet we know that today there are at least 22,000 uh, women who are veterans uh, of this war. Um, so it seems to me that um, I understand you are completing medical school now, currently, and that um, the usual career path is for somebody to have uh, the education and then have uh, some uh, practical experience after the education. You, I think, have had the reverse. You uh, gained some very practical uh, experience on the battlefield and then have had then came back to the classroom. Um, how was that to uh, basically become a student after you had already learned so much uh, in real life? Uh, 
Well, thank you. First of all, I want to make a couple of remarks about uh, gender equality or inequality. Indeed, back in 2014, there was a gender, gender bias uh, that uh, considered women can only be a cook or a medic um, in the war zone nothing else but fortunately in 2016 uh, certain norms uh, were changed and women uh, received an opportunity to um, take combat positions before 2016 women were um, in combat positions de facto but not legally some of them were in intelligence some were machine gunners uh, or snipers but were they on the record they were secretaries or uh, seamstresses. Now we have uh, a big number of women veterans and in the military about 15 percent of uh, active service uh, uh, people are women and of course women is a great resource, uh, underutilized resource for the nation. Our uh, female citizens can contribute a lot uh, for the benefit of the country. As for myself, of course in 2014 it was very difficult uh, to get adapted at the beginning. I had uh, read some theory before and had minimal understanding of what uh, how first medical aid is provided but this was not at all about combat uh, situation so i had to gain my experience with uh, probe uh, trial and error sometimes but i was young was very quick and i was adjusting quickly uh, that includes adapting to the need uh, to not just act on my own but also create a unit and be a leader and a commander and someone people will respect because in a volunteer uh, group people will never uh, follow orders from someone they don't respect. <laughs> so those people those people were essentially trusting me with their lives and uh, <clears throat> other uh, units uh, commanders were trusting me with the lives of their wounded soldiers and later <clears throat> this was in 2018 as I remember I was admitted to the medical academy and I uh, finished uh, two years of the course and now I am on an academic leave uh, while I am a member of the parliament you cannot combine those two things I cannot uh, just give a little time to, to uh, medical studies and uh, give the rest to the uh, legislative work you you have to study to be a medical uh, uh, doctor full-time and many of uh, some there were some uh, situations when my medical professors learned more from me than the other way around on, on certain profiles sometimes even during a lecture I would speak for almost half of the lecture and show our videos was uh, sh sh demonstrating tactical medicine. We had some very good relations with them, and that was poss became possible because I had an uh, individual uh, study program. Because as a person with a disability, I uh, could not uh, move to every floor of the building, uh, but uh, they arranged special classes for me on the uh, ground floor in several uh, classrooms. So I had this special opportunity to, to work with the best professors the school had. The Dnipro uh, Medical Academy uh, made uh, special arrangements for me considering my, uh, uh, my, my schedule, uh, a lot of nuances, plus uh, because I was a combat veteran and I had some uh, problems with memorizing things, uh, those issues uh, are not getting better, unfortunately, for now. Yeah. Yana, you have uh, so much um, to give of yourself in terms of really uh, advancing uh, Ukraine uh, in, in, in many different areas. Um, you mentioned, I mean, this is a, perhaps a topic for another webinar, the role that women have played really throughout Ukraine's history in the battle for Ukraine's um, independence. 
uh, which again, really, uh, you are a shining example uh, of today uh, doing that. Uh, let me turn now, uh, let me say two things. Let me talk a little bit, let us turn to a little bit of your work in the parliament. And then I do wanna then go back to uh, perhaps uh, do you see yourself at all engaged in the current front lines? So Yana, uh, talk about the your goals uh, in terms of what you are trying to achieve uh, as, as a member of Ukraine's parliament. Well, my fate was to take some, to do some very important work and responsibilities, uh, even though I haven't had very much experience, because uh, the, uh, the Verkhovna Rada cancelled, um, uh, closed down a uh, committee for veterans where I hope to work, so they assigned me to be a secretary of the uh, committee for health care. Uh, essentially, I am like uh, second or third most important member of the committee uh, when we uh, pr um, do the voting and uh, produce all the records. I have to pay a lot of attention to the paperwork and I'm comfortable in that uh, committee. I can see we can accomplish many changes. The old system is res resisting those changes, but we know that's the reality. So so we are trying to, to do that. Besides that, I am able to pay attention to issues of war, and uh, how, uh, in fact, I pay day-to-day -day attention to that. The biggest issue is to provide the status of uh, combat veterans to those who were vo in volunteer battalions. Now the law allows that, and I'm trying to help every single uh, member of uh, that uh, combat uh, fighting uh, to uh, ac acquire the status. Many of them did not have the the right papers at the time and uh, so they need help now uh, speaking of my work these days about when when there is a threat of war and new invasion from russia of course we members of parliament now have uh, a lot of responsibility uh, my committee uh, wants to make sure that our medical system is prepared to uh, treat uh, many wounded with the new protocols of treatment and in my committee I am uh, responsible for the subcommittee for medical, med uh, excuse me, um, military medicine, and I uh, examine issues of uh, transportation and uh, supplies. And I can uh, influence uh, resolving certain uh, problematic issues. Not everything is smooth, but we are uh, we are working as much as possible. I'm trying to... Uh, and what was the second part of your question? Uh, I not always remember uh, well. Uh, Oleg Sinsov has joined us. Let us uh, switch to him and continue with a question to you later. Uh, Oleg, we are very thankful to you for joining us for this discussion. I know that you are very busy. Uh, busy with various uh, activities, and I heard that uh, there is now there was a big presentation of your excellent movie, Rhino. Yes, yes, sure. Okay, um, Alec, um, you don't really need much of a introduction. Um, you really captured the world's attention when you were imprisoned. Um, and uh, it's extraordinarily, uh, really to sort of, I was going over uh, some of the reports of the various organizations that fought uh, for your release, uh, including the extraordinary number of Russian um, writers and, and uh, poets and others who signed petitions on your behalf. Um, so uh, let me go straight to uh, some questions perhaps. Um, you were born in Simferopol. Yeah. And it's, uh, and it's my understanding that you were an entrepreneur before you turned to filmmaking and that you had, I guess, a gaming uh, enterprise. Uh, 
or club or something. So what then uh, prompted you to change your career and uh, go into filmmaking? Well, indeed, from uh, since I was a child, I wanted to go into business. This was interesting for me, and I studied, uh, attended a school of uh, economy, and I achieved certain, uh, made some achievements. Uh, but then I realized that uh, studying economy wasn't as much fun for me. Making money just for money is not what I wanted to, to live for. That, that's not what we are born for. I always wanted to do something creative and I began to develop some ideas about films and was making some notes uh, of scripts and then I realized that the only area where I really want to work in in this world is movie, movies and I have spent decades in it and I'm not sorry. Oleg, uh, you were born and raised in Simferopol and uh, certainly there is no question that you are a patriot of Ukraine. Uh, where did that come from? Uh, was that something that, that uh, was transmitted to you by your family? What, was, what influenced you uh, to go the direction you did in terms of standing up to uh, oppression and the aggressor Putin? Uh, sorry, I'm not really clear. I understand your question. Please repeat. I'm not not uh, here clear. Well, uh, born in Crimea in Simferopol, yeah. and everybody, uh, you know, the 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 stereotype is that you know people in Crimea are Russian speakers, and therefore you know want to be a part of Russia, and not necessarily are uh, let's say patriots of Ukraine. And certainly, uh, there's no question that you are a patriot of Ukraine. So I guess my question is, what were the influences in your life that made you who you are, I guess? Why, why I am supporting Ukraine, not Russia? No, no, no. To support Ukraine, to feel that you, that you are defending Ukraine, yes. Okay, let me uh, let me ask another question. Uh, when you were in prison, uh, in one of your letters that you wrote, I guess in 2016, it, you said that there is no need to pull us out of here at all costs. If we are to become nails in the coffin of a tyrant, I'd like to be one of these nails. Just know that this particular one will not bend. That was yeah, rather exactly. defiant. <laughs> so pathetic, pathetic speech, but I like it. <laughs> um, and, uh, I I was born in Ukraine and I always considered uh, Ukraine as my uh, motherland. Ukraine had always was the country I belong to, the country that is uh, moving into future, the country that knows what it wants to accomplish. And in 2014 it became very clear that Ukraine is uh, moving to the future, whereas Russia is living living in its past and wants to drag its, drag its neighbors into the past and especially in a, uh, using a military uh, force to do that. So when uh, Russia invaded the Crimea, uh, they, uh, uh, Russia became my personal enemy. I had had uh, friends there who suffered and uh, the war in Donbas was also uh, an, a continuation of that and now they are preparing for a big invasion into the occupation, uh, occupied territories of Donbas, that's a sign of new war. So this is not a war between Russians and Ukrainians. It's a war between uh, people of freedom who want to live in the future and people of the empire who want to live in the past. That's the essence of this conflict. So 
Alec, is my under am I correct to understand that your movie numbers that you actually produced or directed while you were imprisoned? Так, це дуже цікава історія, тому що іноді uh, film directors uh, gain their experience in different ways, and I wrote this dystopian uh, play about the totalitarian world first, and then I got there into prison uh, after I wrote about it. So it's interesting how one uh, may like look into their future that's an interesting thing and i'm very thankful to the people who were making that film while i was in prison and i helped them as much as i could via letters and to me uh, film is not just an art, uh, that, that film numbers, it was a social project of support because it was giving me a uh, meaning of life. When you spend five years in prison without any information, it's very hard to be on your own there when everybody around is, is an enemy. Uh, did I also read correctly that you didn't want your family to come visit because you saw the uh, the impact it had on i guess other prisoners who did have family visit them do you want to tell us a little bit about that this was very difficult because i f first they took me to a faraway place in north siberia where physically uh, a travel is is very difficult whereas my mother was 85 years old and uh, the babies it would be very difficult for them to physically make that journey to that prison camp. Plus, it would cause them a lot of uh, suffer, uh, a lot of pain, just getting there and then uh, parting again. So I said, let's let's resort to just phone calls and uh, letters. I was allowed to have one phone call per per month for ten minutes. Your most recent film, Rhino, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing it. I guess Netflix um, has purchased it. And do you know when it will be released for us to be able to see it? Yes, this film uh, was started 10 years ago. Uh, and it shows the tragedy of a person who uh, at the time did not have a choice and uh, took uh, an evil course of life. And I also wanted to show that environment of uh, lawlessness in the aftermath of the collapse of the USSR when uh, the new life was being built uh, in that black phase of this person's life. And this uh, film also shows us how Ukraine moved from that lawless uh, society to a uh, European type uh, law based could be said uh, society. That, at least the, uh, the trailer that I saw that it really to me was allegorical about, uh, as you say, what was happening in the 90s. Um, I guess your, your film is about gangs, but uh, having traveled to Ukraine at that time, um, the images that I saw in your trailer were uh, things that you would see uh, in, you know, in restaurants on the street. There was that was a time of um, certain parts of Ukraine society were flaunting their their wealth, um, uh, almost like you say uh, they were almost like caricatures in your film. Uh, that that really what was taking place. So, uh, is it also a statement of as you say what was taking place in Ukraine, the darker side of what was happening in the '90s in Ukraine? Yes, the 1990s was a difficult part, uh, a difficult uh, period in our life, in the life of Ukraine, even though it's over, but some of those traits are still around. Take Yanukovych as an example. The president 
against whom uh, Maidan rose. He is a person of uh, the 1990s. He is a rhino that uh, survived and grew up to be a president and made his uh, fellow gangsters, uh, the rulers of the Ukraine, uh, using the notions of gangsters and Putin. And that's why Maidan uh, rose up. They wanted to put an end to those times, even though those gangsters are now wearing uh, tuxedos, but still they, uh, their, um, their behavior did not change. That uh, was a rem from the past and so Ukraine was able to make a big step forward. Uh, Alec, I made my first trip to Ukraine in 1990, January 1990, and I used to go four or five times a year. Um, I did see what I saw portrayed in this trailer, but I also was aware of really a lot of the positive things that were uh, developing within Ukraine, I think, which then actually led to the expression, whether it was the Orange Revolution or the, the Maidan, do you capture any of the positive parts of what was happening in the 90s in that film? Well, yes, there are some uh, some nostalgia about those times, about the people show different emotions, but all in all, this film is uh, heavy, difficult, because it's not amusing, not entertaining. It shows uh, the tragedy of a person who chose a wrong path in life, people who uh, it's the film is not for those who lived then it's for the young people who live today and need to understand that they should not repeat that mistake and take a path of light not a path of darkness I hope that my next movie my next film will be more uh, light this last one uh, had to be dark because it was uh, I had to do it my future films are going to be more positive more interesting and the time will come to make a film about Maidan and uh, occupation of the Crimea and the war and uh, the prison. But now I cannot do that because that experience is still painful for me. Uh, this theme, that theme is not over. Occupation of the Crimea uh, still goes on and I cannot make a film about that now. For real art, uh, uh, in order to avoid becoming a piece of propaganda, uh, you need a certain time, a distance of time to, to happen. Speaking of uh, current events and uh, I know there's some questions about what is it that uh, we in, uh, can do to help Ukraine at this time? Uh, what are the particular needs that you see? Uh, what would you like to see? What more uh, of assistance would you like to see, whether it's from the United States or other democracies of the world? Um, maybe Jana, I ask you that first and then Oleg. Зараз, Це дійсно стає великою проблемою всього світу, тому що вчорашня його виступ це була цільна погроза. Він не вважає Україну суб'єктом державності, не вважає її країною і <coughs> хоче зробити все, щоб вона перестала існувати. Зараз можуть початися події на те, щоб знищити взагалі Україну як державу. Це дуже серйозна може початися військові дії в тому числі, тому що це гібридна війна буде і інший, і кібератаки буде, і політичний вплив, економічний, соціальний дуже-дуже різний. І в цей саме час дійсно ми очікуємо від е, Сполучених Штатів підтримку військово, політично, економічно, тому що це е, дійсно наш головний партнер, головний, головний союзник, який показує всім приклад не тільки розвитку демократії, не тільки економічного розвитку, но й того, що треба підтримувати тих, хто знаходиться в біді, тому що ці люди розділяють такі саме цінності, як вони. 
Jana, would you like to uh, make some comments? Can you please repeat your question because I am in, I am involved in some exchanges with uh, with my uh, colleagues uh, I have to respond to some text messages uh, the question is what is it uh, what kind of uh, assistance would you additional assistance would you like to see from the United States and other uh, democracies Western democracies? I think the most important thing now is a unified solidarity of all our partners, not just the United States and Great Britain, because what we see today is really a threat of war, and this war is likely going to expand further. What was announced yesterday uh, by Mr. Putin, everybody understands what is going to follow next. Including today, as far as I know, uh, there will be some additional uh, resolutions voted by the Duma to allow Putin to move troops into uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. We have that information. It might not be confirmed, but it's very likely. So it's very important for our partners to not just uh, limit themselves with sanctions and humanitarian assistance, but also uh, take take part more actively uh, otherwise. Speaking of humanitarian assistance, however, what is important now is high-tech assistance, certain things like uh, copter chapters or uh, certain weapons in uh, medical aspect. In the medical aspect, we probably would like to have more of uh, assist medical help kits uh, of international standard because we um, do not have sufficient uh, amount. Uh, we are not able to provide initial amount of medical bags and medical backpacks. Uh, and uh, specific tools, so getting more help on that from the United States would be great. Oleg, uh, I've been reminded uh, by several people about your very eloquent uh, testimony that you gave uh, upon your release in at various forums. Um, you are uh, an incredibly talented, uh, of course, not only writer, filmmaker, but uh, a spokesperson. Uh, do you have? Um, are, are you? Uh, do you have any uh, appearances in the near future uh, that you will be speaking to some of the issues regarding what's going on um, in terms of Putin's war against Ukraine? I'm sorry, I'm not not to hear you very clear uh, ending of your question. Well, you have been you have given uh, testimonies in the past before various bodies, the Helsinki Commission and the others. Uh, you were sponsored to the United States by the Penn Organization. Uh, do you have any plans in the immediate future uh, to be uh, coming and uh, testifying? Uh, in, in front of any uh, particular international bodies about the situation that's going on in Ukraine? I'm not going to leave Ukraine, even if uh, a war begins. I will join other men and go to the, to, to the front line. I want to defend my country with weapons in my hands. Uh, every man who can fight will be very important and I, we will be defending our country. That will be uh, the most important thing for me. I cannot do anything else now. Uh, Oksana, can you help me please with, uh, I cannot see some of the questions that are coming in. Uh, if you could please uh, cover some of the questions. Sure, yet yeah, there is a question uh, from an anonymous attendee. As a Crimean Tatar Americans, we pray for Ukraine uh, that this difficult time, uh, this is difficult times. We hope that the Western nations take a much needed stronger action against Putin to th uh, threat attack, to attack Ukraine. 
Crimean Tatars for the first, past eight years have displayed and continue to display one of the strongest resistance to Russia's illegal occupation of their ancestral homeland. They are being arrested and imprisoned for their ongoing resistance. What is the status of Crimean Tatars resistance in Crimea? Is this a question for me? Yes. What can you say about the resistance uh, to Putin in the Crimea today? The Crimean Tatars are a nation that has lived on this land, it's their homeland for many centuries and this indigenous nation is now subjected to um, low intensity genocide. He, Putin has really made this nation his own, uh, his own uh, hostages and uh, if you don't agree with the regime, you go to prison, you get accusations and charges of terrorism or something else and people, uh, men go to prison, their families and children stay without support and those people all they want is to live peacefully on their land. They are not accepting Russia's occupation because they know that Russia uh, is an heir of the Soviet Union and nothing good will come from, from that. Russia is um, not letting the Tatars to decide the future of their land and this is an issue that needs to be brought up to a wider discussion at the level of the United Nations and other uh, government uh, entities. It's a low intensity genocide. They are placed in something like a reservation that that cannot be done in the 21st century. Jana, did you uh, have something that you would like to add about? I'll say a few words as a member of the opposition in the parliament. I think over the last two years we don't see enough attention uh, from Ukraine's government to the issue of uh, Tatar, uh, Crimean Tatars. There have been many displaced people, not just from Donbas, but from the Crimea as well. And it's my personal observations. The Crimean Tatars are probably more enduring. Uh, uh, there are many of them who are staying under occupation, but they maintain an active uh, civic uh, uh, stand, which is why they often get arrested uh, by the gov by Russian government, but they still don't surrender. It's been for eight years and they continue to resist. So the Ukrainian government must uh, hold a consolidated position on this and provide more social protection to those categories of people until we regain those territories, but it will happen one day. Uh, two days from now, we are проводити конференцію в Вашингтоні з питань ветеранських ветеранської діяльності і допомоги українським ветеранам. Звичайно, є особлива категорія ветеранів – це військовополонені, які пережили унікальні uh, uh, події в їх житті. Uh, Чи існує програма підтримки для колишніх військовополонених в Україні? І чи може Захід щось додаткове зробити для, для цих людей? Для... Може, пане Олег, чи, 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 чи знаєте ви організацію, яка, яка працює з військовополоненими? At the level of the government, 
there is still no uh, pro special program for rehabilitation or physical and psychological rehabilitation for people who lived through uh, imprisonment. At be in best case, uh, they are given, uh, they are helped with uh, getting uh, housing and maybe some uh, little uh, one-time stipend, but then they are on their own. We have a civil organization that I helped to establish uh, that is fighting for release of all prisoners uh, of uh, conscience and prisoners of war, in either in Russia or in the Crimea, in the Donbass. Us. We don't distinguish between uh, those categories. For us, an individual who suffered uh, was uh, taken prisoner by Russia, either with weapons in hands or as a civic activist. Those are people who have uh, stood for Ukraine and uh, we demand that they uh, need to be released. But this is the work is, that is mostly carried out by volunteers or civic organizations. Unfortunately, there is no such government program. We would be very thankful if you could take some of those people to your premises to help them go through rehabilitation medically and psychologically, because those are people who have certainly been traumatized and maybe that change of environment would help them uh, to regain um, sanity and, and good condition. Uh, yes, I recall talking with uh, Mikhailo Hodding, who sat in the gulags, right, in the 80s, 90s, and he told me that nobody uh, comes out of these prison camps that is not changed, uh, profound, had profound chains. Um, so yes, it's something that um, hope we can perhaps help you uh, with that and see if we can help um, organize some additional assistance. Um, I. Uh, our time is nearly up. I am e extremely grateful that you've taken time during this very uh, stressful and incredibly challenging um, time. And I just want to say that I hope you know that uh, people here in the United States and all over are standing with you. Uh, before you both came on, I talked about the rally that was held vigil in front of the Lincoln Memorial uh, Sunday to honor the heavenly hundred, but also the 45,000 casualties since that first heavenly hundred. And present were there, uh, not only representatives of Ukrainian American organizations, but Belarusian organizations, also uh, the Freedom, the Free Russia Foundation. Uh, there were any number of Russians who were there saying, you know, I'm Russian, but we stand with Ukraine. And so um, I, I hope that you are heartened that um, you're, you're not being forgotten and that we are all working and doing our best to see that um, you are getting the, all the tools that you need to fight off this aggressor. And also uh, I re reminded uh, people in, in my remarks that uh, you know the American Revolution um, was fought. Uh, George Washington started with a volunteer army uh, and then, you know, ultimately won against a superpower. And uh, we know and believe that um, you, you know, Ukrainians will prevail in this fight against this, this tyrant. So uh, our prayers and thoughts are with you. Thank you very much. If you would like to have a, a, some, a closing comment. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to talk. Thank you for your work, for all you're doing for Ukraine. We will never forget this. And we will know that uh, we have such a strong and honest partner that will not give up supporting us uh, in uh, trouble. We are very thankful to America, to the government, the president. We are very thankful. Jana, would you like to just a couple of closing remarks? 
Yes, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank everyone for today's uh, activity, for, for everything you do every month, every day, all through these years. Especially, I want to emphasize that the Ukrainian diaspora, all over the world and in the United States especially, when I was at the front line and now in a different uh, role in the parliament, I have always felt that we have this backup behind us. You always uh, support our country, holding us in your arms. You're helping us to resolve those problems we are still not able to resolve, matters such as funding budgets. And this is very important for us. And I'm very pleased that you are there with us. Слава Україні! Героям слава!